Okay, friends, welcome again. Uh, and we are continuing today in our sermon series through the book of Proverbs. We are currently in chapter eight. And if you've noticed, this is the first time ever in CCC history we have a folded liturgy because the passage is, is so long, but I had to preach the whole chapter, okay? It's just one whole thought, and it'd be awkward if we kind of broke it up to different sermons. Um, so uh, we're gonna preach the whole thing, the whole chapter today, Proverbs chapter eight. However, since it is such a big piece of scripture, let me just start off by stating first the main point or the main purpose of Proverbs chapter eight, okay? And uh, Solomon's main purpose in Proverbs chapter eight is to intensify the weight of wisdom's words. The purpose Solomon had in writing Proverbs chapter eight is to intensify for us, the readers, the weight of wisdom's words. Whatever it is that wisdom's told us to do thus far, okay? What has she said? for us to do. She's told us to be righteous, to be just, to fear the Lord, to memorize his word, to not be selfish, to not commit adultery, to watch our tongues when we speak, to uphold marital purity. All of the things that he's told us to do for the past eight chapters uh, is, is chapter eight here is meant to remind us that those things she said weren't just good suggestions. They weren't just nice things to get to whenever we have the time to do so. Whatever she's told us to do, Lady Wisdom, in the past eight chapters, are urgent, fatal matters of life and death. And seeking them should be the immediate priority of our lives. That's the point of Proverbs chapter eight. But now, the way Solomon increases the weight of Wisdom's words here in this chapter is interesting. He doesn't do it just by telling us how important her commands are. He does it by revealing to us who Lady Wisdom really is. Okay, that's what this chapter is all about. It's about who Lady Wisdom is, where she's been, what she's done, how close she is to God, and therefore, how important her words are. Okay, that's kind of the thrust here, and you'll see that as we read the chapter. Okay, so my, so my prayer for us today is that as we study this passage, one, we'll have a clearer picture of who La- Lady Wisdom really is, And number two, whatever it is you remember her telling you to do in the past eight chapters, okay, it won't just be a list of good suggestions anymore for us, but it'll be fatal matters of life and death that we must take seriously. If we we accomplish those two things, we would have accomplished what um, I think, and I'm convinced, is the purpose of this chapter. Okay, so let's get to it. This is God's word, taken from Proverbs chapter eight, verse one to 36. Again, it's a long passage, so stick with me um, as as we do so. This is the word of God. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice on the heights beside the way, on the crossroads she takes her stand? Beside the gates, in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries aloud, to you, O men, I call. And my cries to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense, hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They're all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instructions instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom, I have insight, I have strength. By me, kings reign, and rulers decree what is just. By me, prince rules, and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield and choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness and the path of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago, I was set up 
At the first, before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields or the first of the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned limits, uh, the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the fountains of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman. And I was daily his delight. Rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. And now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors, for whoever finds me finds life and attains honor, favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. Thus says the Lord. Here's what I want to point out from the passage today. If we want to see our hearts begin to take Lady Wisdom's commands more seriously, then we must, first, see her innocence and beauty, second, revere her credentials and status. Third, realize what makes her dance and sing. Okay, three things. If you want to start taking what you've read in chapter eight more seriously, you've got to see wisdom's innocence and beauty, you've got to revere wisdom's credentials and status, and you've got to realize what made her dance and sing. Let's start with the first point. Let's see wisdom's innocence and beauty. So, If you take a look at the first three verses again with me, check it out, what you'll see there is that Lady Wisdom is crying out to us. From where? From the entrance of a city gate. That's the image we have painted here, okay? You see all those city gate imageries there in verse three? Lady Wisdom's crying out beside the gates, it says, in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal. What what Solomon's trying to do here is he's trying to paint this picture of a traveler of sorts, who's sort of approaching the entrance of a city from from the quiet wilderness toward a bussing ancient Near Eastern town with cattle mooing and people chattering and salesmen screaming and prostitutes offering and politicians arguing and con men lurking and this traveler suddenly finds himself a bit overwhelmed His senses are are hyperactivated. His anxiety is abruptly awakened. Why? Well, because he realizes that he's about to enter into high decision-making time. You see, he's going to have to make tons of decisions quickly, and some of them might be life-altering. Who to trust, what to buy, where to go, when to say yes, and when to say no. And from the city gate entrance, we hear Lady Wisdom calling out to us, and you best listen to her, Solomon says, before you enter, heed her call, follow her instructions. But why? And and, and here's the main point. Why listen to Lady Wisdom? Well, the obvious answer is because wisdom is useful, right? Wisdom can, can, can save you from these bad people. Wisdom can save you from these bad decisions. Wisdom can protect you from the adulterous woman, as we've read the past few chapters. Wisdom can even help you rule whole cities, Solomon says in verses 15 to 16. You see that? She can turn, to, turn you into kings who reign and, and, and prince who rules and nobles who govern. In fact... Wisdom, Solomon continues in verses 18 to 21, might even help you make a little bit of money. And that's totally fine. That's great. Why not? Solomon lists out all the practical benefits of wisdom in verses 15 to 21. You could lead, you could rule, you can make some money. That's fine. Enjoy them if you get them. But what's interesting is that those practical benefits weren't Solomon's first proposition in this argument. Those come later in verses 15 to 21. But before that, look at verses six to nine. 
What was Solomon's first reason as to why this traveler should seek wisdom? It's because wisdom, Solomon says in verses six to nine, is true, noble, and right. True, noble, and right. That's it. And, and this is really important, Solomon's saying here, that you get the order right, okay? If you really want to be protected in the city, which symbolizes high decision-making time, if you really want to be protected in the city, you must first and foremost seek wisdom for wisdom itself and not just because of the practical benefits that wisdom might get you. That's his, that's his point here. In other words, you must treat wisdom as beautiful and not just as useful. What do I mean? A pastor once explained the difference between usefulness and beauty in, in this way, and I've, I've used this a few times before, but it seems appropriate here. He said this, uh, how many people here listen to music? How many people here watch movies? Why do you get lost in poetry? Why do you read books? Why do you stare at paintings for hours? Are those things useful? Absolutely not. Do they pay your bills? You know, do they pay your rent? Do they put food on the table? No. So why do you do them? Because they are beautiful. See, something's beautiful to you when it becomes an end goal in itself and not just as a stepping stone to get something else. That's what Solomon is saying here. You must treat wisdom as beautiful and not just as useful. That's really important you get the order right because here's why. If you treat wisdom merely as useful, Okay, just as a stepping stone to get something else. What'll happen is that the thing that you're trying to, to possess through wisdom will end up possessing you. If you treat wisdom just as useful, whatever it is you're trying to possess through wisdom will end up possessing you. What do I mean? Uh, look, you might get a bit of money through me, Lady Wisdom says in verses 18 to 21, that's fine. But she says first in verses 10 to 11, you should seek me, not money. A commentary I use puts it this way. Uh, when silver is the reward of wisdom, it edifies, but when made the aim of one's life, it corrupts. When, when silver is just sort of a side benefit to wisdom, it actually edifies you. But if you make that the main purpose of your life, it'll corrupt. Now, how, okay, how can you tell all right, whether or not you treat wisdom as useful or beautiful. Well, Solomon continues in our passage, he gives a clarification by saying that you can tell if you treat wisdom merely as useful and not as beautiful, you can tell by the way you act when you get the thing that you seek. You can tell whether or not you treat wisdom as useful or beautiful by the way you act when, when you finally get that thing that you seek. Take a look at verses 15 to 16 with me. Wisdom there says, by me, through me, kings and rulers and nobles, what? Reign and rule, right? That's great. But here's how you can tell whether or not someone became a king as a side reward for wisdom and not because that's what he wanted uh, this whole time from the beginning. Someone who becomes king as a side reward for wisdom will rule with justice, he says in verses 15 to 16. Justice is mentioned twice there. He'll rule with equity. He'll rule with fairness. Why? Because wisdom hates pride and arrogance, verse 13 says. But implied here, on the other hand, if you just use wisdom merely as a stepping stool to become a king, then you know what happened once you become king? You won't actually become a king. You know what you'll be? You'll be a tyrant. You won't rule with justice. You won't rule with equity, but with inequality. You won't actually possess kingship, but kingship will possess and enslave you. That's what a tyrant is, by the way. People enslaved by their own power. And this goes with every position in life. If you get, for example, promoted to director, okay, uh, because you're truly wise, well, then you'll be a fair director who directs justly. 
But, for example, if you become a director only because you used wisdom as a stepping stone to become a director, once you get there, you'll become a bully. Your directorship will possess you. You get ordained as a pastor because you're truly wise. Great, you'll probably be a good and just pastor. But if you fooled everyone around you and actually you just used wisdom to get ordained as a pastor, then once you're ordained, you know what you'll be? You'll be a spiritual abuser. You won't become a pastor. Your pastorship will possess you, will enslave you. Here's a good principle I think we can get from Proverbs chapter eight. You'll know what kind of leader someone will be by the way they got to the top. And also, you will know how someone got to the top by the way they currently lead. If you seek wisdom just because of the practical benefits it could give you, you won't end up possessing those practical de- benefits, but those practical benefits will end up possessing and enslaving you. So if you wanna make it in the city, Solomon's telling the traveler here, then seek wisdom for wisdom. She's beautiful before she is useful in her essence and in her motivation. Look at the end of verse eight. Solomon says, there's nothing twisted or crooked in her. There's nothing self-serving about her, which means she's not trying to get anything out of you. She's not telling you to do these commands because she has an ulterior motive. She wants to guide you for you. But she can only do that if you love her for her. Love wisdom, seek wisdom, because she's innocent and beautiful, not just because she's practical, okay? That's the first reason. But, he continues, also listen to wisdom because of her credentials and status, which leads us to our second point. Revere wisdom's credential and status. Okay, so we move on now to the second part of the poem, verses 22 to 29. And wisdom here sort of takes over as as narrator, Okay, and she begins to address herself in first person. You see that? Look at verse 23. Wisdom said, ages ago before the world was made, I was set up. I was set up, she said. Now, just a quick but important note here. Wisdom isn't some sort of demigod. Okay, she's not some sort of lesser God or ethereal being that was somehow present with God before the world was formed. That, that's not Solomon's point here. So what does he mean by, I was set up before the world was made? Maybe a potential way uh, to explain Solomon's personification of wisdom here, although I have to admit this isn't a perfect explanation. Okay, this is just an attempt to help us think about it. Maybe a way to think about it is to think of wisdom as sort of the necessary elements and truths and laws that must first be set in place in order for the world to be created at all. What do I mean? For example, unless, let's say, the law of gravity was already set up before the world existed, the ground upon which all life depends on won't remain intact and be able to support life on Earth. Or maybe, for example, unless a clear difference is first set up prior to to the world existing between solids and liquids and gas, the islands would be indistinguishable from the oceans and the clouds would fall upon us and crush us. You see? Maybe that's one way to think about wisdom's personification here, but, but... if you don't feel like that's a good explanation, either way, the point is that wisdom is not a demigod, okay? She is whatever it was that was needed to be set up in order for, look at verses 28 to 29, in order for the skies to remain firmly above us and not fall down and crush us. You see that? Wisdom is whatever needed to be set up in order for the islands to be distinguishable from the oceans and not flood us. Verse 29 says that. Wisdom is whatever needed to be set up in order for the foundations of the earth to remain intact and not crumble below us, verse 29 says. You see that? Wisdom is the necessary structure and elements needed for this world to function and exist as we know it does now. Or in a more poetic way, 
Solomon puts it in verse 30 like this. Wisdom is God's master workman. He's got, she's God's master workman. Okay, what was the point of all that just now? Why did wisdom just really like show off her credentials here, right? She was, she was bragging, uh, look at this, look at all that I've done. Well, she did it not to brag. She did it not to st- strike her own ego. But as mentioned earlier, she did it so that you and I would take her words more seriously. She's saying, look, children of men, I know what I'm talking about. I really do. Here are my credentials. Here are a list of my previous projects. My letter of recommendation comes from God himself. I was with the great I am when all of this was made. I was. And you're just going to take my words in the past eight chapters as what? Good suggestions? (laughs) Don't you know who I am? These aren't good suggestions from a self-help book. These are words that are coming out of the mouth of God's very own cosmic artisan who shaped the fabric of reality itself. They're not pretty suggestions. So so Solomon's trying to tell us here, when wisdom says, treat the covenant of marriage with utmost honor and respect, you better well do so. When wisdom says, mind your tongue and how you use your words, you better well do so. When she says, study, memorize, and obey God's word, keep it near to your heart, you better well do so. Why? Not because there are a list of religious things for you to do. Not because there are things that could help you uh, feel better about yourself. No. Do those things because the person who knows how the universe works, the person who understands the blueprint of reality like the back of her own hand, the artisan of God's cosmic order is telling you that this is the best way to live in this reality. This is it, by honoring the covenant of marriage, by reading and obeying God's word, by not taking shortcuts to joys only God can offer. I know how this world works. By the way, isn't it interesting that wisdom is the only one who can say, I was, to all of the rhetorical questions that God asked Job in our confession of sin passage earlier. Do you notice that? Take a look at our confession of sin passage again from your liturgy printouts. How did God rebuke Job? He asked Job, uh, you're questioning my decisions? Okay. Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I made the clouds like garment and thick Darkness like a swaddling band. Were you there when I made the proud wave stay and not flood the land? Were you there when I entered into the springs of the sea and walked in the recesses of the deep? And that made Job shut his mouth real quick because he couldn't say yes. None of his friends could say yes and none of us here could say yes either. But you know who can say yes? Lady Wisdom. Wisdom. She's the only one who can say, in fact, yes, I was there. At the first, before the beginning of the earth, I was there. Before the hills were brought forth, I was there. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he set the foundations of the deep, I was there. I was, I was with the great I am when he did all of these things. I know how this thing called life works, guys. I really do. So listen to me. Listen to me. Why would you ever trust your own passions over me? Why would you ever trust your own reasoning over mine? You weren't there. I was. Listen to wisdom because she's innocent and beautiful. Listen to wisdom because of her credentials and status. That's not all. 
You should also want to listen to Lady Wisdom. Solomon continues in the last part of our passage because she's deeply, deeply invested in your well-being. Which leads us to our last point. We gotta see what makes her dance and sing. Okay, what made Lady Wisdom dance and sing? Okay, friends, I wanna invite you to take a look again at the list of projects that Lady Wisdom bragged about doing in verses 27 and 29. And as you take a look at that list, I want us to notice how all the works that Lady Wisdom did here revolved around making this world more inhabitable or livable for human beings. Do you notice that? That's, that's why she does what she did. Let me ask you, for whose sake is it that the ocean waters have limits and not flood over the land? Hmm? For whose sake is it that the skies remain above there and not fall upon the earth like solid matter? For whose sake is it that the core foundations of the earth remain intact and not crumble into space? Who benefits from all this? We do. And, and you see that beautifully depicted by Solomon in verses 30 to 31. Take a look at the end of verse 30 there. Wisdom at the end of verse 30 is described to be doing what? Rejoicing before the Lord. Now, the word rejoicing there is actually better translated to the word frolicking. You know what frolicking means? Frolicking is when someone's dancing and singing. You know, imagine a little girl in the garden just frolicking her way. Wisdom is frolicking before the Lord, dancing and singing, but, but why? Why was wisdom frolicking before the Lord? Now this is important, look at verse 31. Wisdom was frolicking before the Lord, not just because the world was created, no, no, but because the world became more and more what, verse 31 says? Inhabitable. For who? For the children of men. In other words, for you and for me. So, so picture here, Lady Wisdom, you know, dancing and singing before the Lord as the world is kind of being made and, her, and the excitement of her movements gradually increased. The volume of her song slowly rose as mankind started to appear in the picture to live in this new home. Let, let's just pause and, and think about that for a second. God's cosmic artisan danced and sung with delightful glee over the idea that you would have a place to call home. You ever had someone dance over you? <laughs> you ever had someone so invested in your well-being that the idea of you finding a home and being happy made them dance? Lady Wisdom did that. I did that for you, she sang. So would you please listen to me, O oh sons, she continues in verse 32. Would you? Would you keep my ways? Would you hear my instructions? I'm not out here to get you. These aren't tyrannical rules meant to make you miserable. This is simply the best way to live your life in this world. Trust me, I know. How do I know? Because I made it. I know how this whole place operates. And this is how you live in it. This is how you enjoy it. This is how you work it. By being truthful and selfless, by upholding integrity, by not taking shortcuts toward joy, by honoring the covenant of marriage, by studying and observing God's word. I'm not out here to get you. I know how the world really works. And lastly, I, I really do love you. I really do love you. I danced as I built you a home. And you finally had it. You got that home. In Genesis chapter one, I gave it to you. But you wrecked it. You wrecked it. You listened to the serpent, you disobeyed God's word, you ate that fruit, and you wrecked the home I've made for you. 
And now this holy garden city I had in mind became a wasteland. Look at this place now. It's not a place fit to call home anymore. It's filled with tsunamis. The waves no longer stay. It's filled with earthquakes. It's filled with floods and pandemics and famines and droughts and dengue fever mosquitoes and wars and betrayals and heartbreaks. You can almost picture in Genesis 3, for the first time in history, Lady Wisdom's dance stopped. The day Adam and Eve ate from that tree. And the day that her warnings at the end of our passage today, the last verse of our passage today, became a reality. He who fails to find me injures himself, and all who hate me love death. That's what happened in Genesis chapter three. In our foolishness, we have injured ourselves. Like sheep, we've all gone astray, following our own way, and now death marks this world. Not dancing, not singing. And Lady Wisdom can't do anything about it. She can't, why not? Because remember, she's not a real being. She's not, she's just poetically personified here as a real being to make a point, but she's not a real being. She can't actually dance or sing or save us. She's an impersonal entity, a tool in the maker's hand. So, let me ask you this. If she's a tool in the maker's hand, whose emotions really have we actually been talking about this whole time? Hmm? Who's dancing and singing over you? Who's innocently desiring to guide you? Not Lady, not lady Wisdom, but Lady Wisdom's owner. If you look at a carpenter making a table and you say, man, that hammer is dancing away in his hands, what do you really mean there? Do you actually mean that the hammer is doing the dancing? No. You mean that the carpenter who wields the hammer is using it in such a way to where his joy can clearly be seen even in the hammer's movements. It's God's joy here, friends, we've been witnessing. It's God's heart we've been feeling. It's God's innocence, God's beauty, God's credentials, God's deep love for us. That's what we've been talking about. So yes, Lady Wisdom can't save us from this wasteland, but you know who can? God can. And he did. He did. How? Well, you ever wonder, friends, why Jesus told the Pharisees in John chapter eight that before Abraham was, what? I am. You know what he's claiming to be there? He's claiming to be Lady Wisdom's owner. I am. Before anything else existed, Jesus said, I am. So how did Wisdom's owner save us? Friends, by becoming one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. Through wisdom, the great I am wrote himself into this created world. Why? So that he could take upon himself the consequences of Adam's race. And so that he could give us a new home, you see. A new heavens and a new earth, but this time incorruptible, this time eternal. Why? Because it was built on the foundation of his blood. If in the garden, wisdom stopped her dancing, surely on that cross she began again. As she witnessed her wielder commence a new building project called the church and the construction of a new home called heaven that was all paid through his own life on a cross. Behold, friends, wisdom's owner, 
the eternal God. He's beautiful. His motives are pure. His credentials staggering. And he dances over the idea of you having a home. So much so, he was willing to give his own life for it. So as Solomon's point goes here, you would be an absolute fool not to take his words and instructions with the utmost honor, gratitude, urgency, and respect. Let's pray. Father, you've made this home for us and you rejoiced in the fact that the children of men, mirrors of your image, would have a place, would have a stage where the dance of your glory be performed over and over and over again till eternity, but we wrecked it. We chose our own moves, we listened to our own music, we went our own way. But you did not leave us to our own demise, you came, wrote yourself into our story, the embodiment of God's wisdom, the owner of wisdom himself, who now no longer holds wisdom like a hammer to shape the new creation, but put the hammer down and held nails instead. And now the new building project can commence, not by the strength of our own, but by the mercy and sacrifice of the great eternal God who became poor and died for us. Help us now, Father, take your words with much more weight and seriousness. May we no longer insult them as merely good suggestions, but urgent matters of life and death straight from the mouth of he who knows how to live in this reality that he's built. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.